But beloved in Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today's gospel that the Holy Spirit inspired St. Mark to record for our instruction is a magnificent and impressive text. And it's a familiar story that nearly every person, Christian and non-Christian alike, has heard. I've preached the message many times. In fact, this event is the only non-resurrection event that is recorded by all four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The reason is obvious. And this portion of scripture is so impressive, and the miracle described within it is so great, that it ought to cause within each of us a sense of immense wonder and awe. Because this miraculous event that we will see revealed to us in scripture this morning will reveal for us the tremendous compassion Christ has for all people. Today's reading is from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 6, verse 30 through verse 44. I would ask again if you're able to rise out of respect for the glorious Gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in its truth. Your words are truth. Thank you. Please be seated. Our story begins by telling us that the apostles had now returned to Jesus. This is referring to their return from their missionary journey where Christ had sent the disciples out two by two to bring the good news of the kingdom of God to the countryside of Galilee by proclaiming the repentance of sins and the forgiveness of them in Jesus' name. We learned about that last week. The apostles were also given the authority to go over unclean spirits to take them away. So the disciples were given the ability to cast out many demons and to anoint with oil many who were sick so they could be healed. And while the Gospels don't specifically tell us how long the disciples had been on their missionary journey, it is most likely that Jesus had set a specific time for them to return and that's what we're seeing going on in our text today. So now the disciples were back. And we can only imagine the eagerness and enthusiasm with which they reported everything about their journey to Christ, telling him all that they had done on their missionary adventures, winning souls for the kingdom. Indeed, what a pleasing experience sharing Christ with others truly is. The text goes on to say that Jesus withdrew with the twelve by boat to a desolate place so that they could rest and spend quiet and undisturbed time with their Lord. This is good advice for us as well. 
Because it's important as a Christian to get away from the craziness of the world. To spend quality time alone with God in his word and in prayer. So Jesus and his disciples were planning a much needed rest in a desolate place, but we're told this plan fell apart because crowds of people from all the nearby towns found out where they were going and ran to be with them. And the fact that it was now the time of Passover, as stated in John's Gospel, the sheer number of people seeking Jesus was in the thousands. But why specifically were they pursuing Jesus? Well, if we look again to John's Gospel, we are given the answer. John 6, 2 reads, And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. In other words, many in the crowd were not initially drawn to Christ to receive his forgiveness of sins and gift of salvation, no. They were following after Jesus because of the many miracles that he was performing. And while the words that Jesus preached would have certainly changed the hearts and minds of many, most who were chasing after him were following him because of the great attraction of his miracles, not because of his teachings. In fact, if you know your scriptures, you may remember that by verse 66 of this same chapter, it tells us many of his disciples turned away from Jesus and no longer walked with him. Why? Because of the sharp truth of his words. You see, many were following Jesus only because of their bodily needs and the physical things that he was offering. And just like so many people today seek after preachers who will scratch their itching ears and give them what they want to hear, these people were seeking only after the temporal contentment and satisfaction that is often touted in Jesus' name. But Christ, friends, doesn't come to us to give us our earthly desires. God comes to us through his word to show us what his plan is for our lives. And when the gospel is rightly proclaimed that Christ must be first in your life above everything else, when the Bible says we are to be obedient to the will of God and that we are to confess our sins and repent of them to ever inherit the kingdom of God, and when Jesus himself tells us we must be humbled and broken and made new, born again, and then even after all of that, we may be persecuted because of our faith and have to take up a cross to follow after him. When one is told the truth of the scriptures, many people turn away from God and are no longer willing to walk with Jesus. When we closely examine the Gospels, we really do see the compassion of Christ. Because even with all the unbelief Jesus encountered during his ministry on earth, and even though he wanted at this time to be alone to rest with his disciples, he still desires to embrace yet another crowd chasing after him. Mark 6 verse 34 reads, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When we look at the word compassion in the Greek, it means that Jesus was deeply moved into his inner being with sympathy and pity for these people. You see, Jesus saw their hearts. He saw their spiritual condition. He knew what the fate of these helpless and lost sheep would be unless they were shepherded and told the truths of God. So Jesus, the good shepherd, began to feed their souls by teaching them many things. He taught them that there's only one message that matters, that they must repent of their sins and believe in the gospel to be saved. And this crowd was seemingly so enthralled with this message of life that they forgot that they were out in the middle of nowhere without any food. Their desire to be with Jesus and receive his gifts had caused them to forget about planning for their physical hunger. The apostles, on the other hand, 
were very much aware of the resources that would be needed to feed all these people. Mark 6, verse 35 and 37 reads, And when it grew late, his disciples came to Jesus and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? So Jesus says to his apostles, Why are you asking me to send this group away? Just give them something to eat. And Jesus clearly knows they don't have enough food to feed all these people. Yet he says to his disciples, you give them something to eat. And then the surly response, well, should we just go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread to feed them, Lord? And of course the disciples didn't have this kind of money. But even if they did, the logistics of bringing in that much food from the neighboring towns for this many people would have been impossible. So then why did Jesus tell his disciples to give the people something to eat? Well, Jesus was testing their faith. He was expecting them to know how the situation could be easily dealt with. Now remember, what has Jesus been doing as he travels around the entire countryside? He was healing, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, opening the ears of the deaf. Miracle upon miracle upon miracle is what Christ has been doing. All done in front of his apostles. In fact, the disciples had just returned from their own missionary journey where they had been given all authority to cast out demons and to heal the sick. You think maybe after knowing and seeing all of this, they might just think that Jesus could be able to create some food to feed these people? Do you think perhaps this guy who's been doing all these miraculous and wondrous things could be able to whip up a few tender morsels to satisfy the crowd? Well, of course he was. You see, Jesus was given the apostles an opportunity to say, well, Lord, you're all powerful. Seeing all your miraculous wonders, why don't you just simply cook dinner for all these folks? Of course, that's not what they said. So they failed the test. Unfortunately, what we see here is the weakness of the disciples' faith showing up yet again. You see, they only saw the impossibilities. They don't see that this difficulty is to make them think of Jesus and all that he has accomplished. So they failed the test. You know, of all the miracles of Christ, the feeding of the 5,000 is certainly among the most impressive. Listen again to the words of God. Mark 6, 38-44 again reads, And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the, the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and said a blessing to his father and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. What we see here is thousands of people are asked to get ready to dine on five barley cakes and two fish. But I want you to think with me for a moment about Mark's detail that the people sat down on the green grass. Remember, this is a desolate place. And when we picture the wilderness in Sinai, we don't see green grass at all. We see a place that is very dry and has very little vegetation. But now that we see Jesus here present with these people as a shepherd for sheep that previously had no shepherd, 
suddenly Mark adds the detail that yes, here we have green grass. I think the Holy Spirit has inspired Mark to shift the picture from the desolation without a shepherd, without Christ, to how when Jesus is there, suddenly it's like the psalmist says in the 23rd Psalm we read earlier, he makes me lie down in green pastures to restore my soul. Here in Mark's gospel, Christ makes them sit down on the green grass, which is a wonderful picture of what the good shepherd is about to do. But Jesus also instructs the disciples to have the crowd sit down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. In other words, everyone was seated in an orderly fashion with paths between the groups to enable them to be easily served. Not to mention an easy way to establish an accurate count on how many people were present that needed to be fed. This is an important fact that can't be missed that really adds to the complete impressiveness of this miracle. You see, all of these people were attended to at one time, serving after serving the seemingly endless supply of bread and fish that Jesus, after giving thanks to God in heaven, broke and gave to the disciples to give to the people. And not only were they all given something to eat, but we are also told that everyone was satisfied. Correctly understanding this means that they were full, bursting at the seams full, had to unbutton the trousers full. And friends, it wasn't just 5,000 people that were fed here either. Because in Matthew's gospel, he tells us that their families were also included in this feeding, which means there may have been up to 20, 25,000 people that were being fed filled to the brim, as full as they could possibly fill themselves, all from five loaves of bread and two small fish. But there's even more to see, because our text says that after everyone was done eating, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of bread and fish, 12 baskets full, 12, one for each of the 12 disciples. And what about Jesus? Where was his portion? Well, he would have counted on his disciples to share their abundant portions with him. From all that Christ gives to you, are you sharing your abundance with him? Friends, the feeding of the 5,000, as it is known, is surely a fantastic miracle of God of enormous proportions. It is an overwhelming evidence that Jesus is God in human flesh. And of all the miracles of Christ, this is surely the largest when it comes to the sheer number of people who were partakers of it and witness to it. Surely the reason why all four gospel writers recorded this astonishing event. And this event can't be denied either because of the sheer numbers of people that were there. In fact, the miracles of Jesus are never denied in Scripture. Do you realize that? They're never denied. The many miracles that he performed are never challenged. No one then, even those who wanted to murder Christ, ever said his miracles didn't occur. But what about now? What do people say now? What do people say about these miraculous things Christ did in our world? Well, sadly, there are many today who try to use the Bible's teachings as merely symbolism to get rid of the miracles. This, of course, gets us into great danger with the Bible because then we can perhaps assume that perhaps there wasn't such a thing as Christ's cross really either. Perhaps he never rose from the dead. Maybe Jesus never died in the first place. No, my friends, the feeding of the 5,000 is a historically recorded miracle of God, plain and simple. And God's book, the Bible, is full of such miracles because we have a God who is performing them. And the only people who deny the miracles of Christ are unbelievers and cynics who are trying to discredit the Bible and deny that Jesus is the Son of God so they can attempt to be Lord of their own lives 
and try to bury the innate, inborn, natural knowledge they possess that there is an eternal soul and that that soul needs Jesus. So as followers of the Lord, we simply give God credit for being what he is, a compassionate Christ. And we just thank him for being concerned for us as his cherished adopted heirs. This tremendous miracle of Jesus is a miracle that is needed in Scripture because it reaffirms to us just who Jesus Christ is, God in human flesh. And knowing that Christ is God, it confirms to us that Jesus is the only Savior of the world and that he alone brings eternal salvation and everlasting life to all who believe and trust in him. Do you realize what the Bible teaches about eternal life? We were talking a little bit about this in Bible study this morning. But the Bible teaches about eternal life a lot. Pretty neat things. It says that there will be no tears, no sorrow, no pain, no suffering anymore. It says we Christians will shine like the sun in the kingdom of God. And that the inheritance waiting for us is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. And the Holy Spirit moved the great apostle Paul to tell us that heaven and eternal life will be so fantastic and so wonderful that we humans can't even visualize it. Listen to these words from Paul. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 reads, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. We read also about the very last day in John 5, 28 and 29, which reads, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all, all, who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good, those who have had faith, those who have done good had faith to the resurrection of life. And those who have done evil, unbelief to the resurrection of judgment. Friends, the feeding of the 5,000 certainly is a magnificent miracle. No doubt about it. But the Bible teaches that the return of Christ and the resurrection of the body will be the greatest of all miracles. It tells us that those who have been born again in Christ through the hearing and receiving of the word, those who are faithful to God and place him first in their lives, those who have confessed their sins and repented of them, <laughs> their bodies will be reunited with their soul and restarted, remade into a glorified body like Christ's. And this, glor this glorious resurrection to, to new life, this gracious gift of God's salvation is going to happen for everyone from the time of Adam who believes and trusts in Jesus. Every true and faithful Christian <laughs> will rise out of the grave in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, and pass from judgment into a glorious life with God in heaven forever. Do you believe this miracle will happen? If you don't, be prepared to spend eternity in a horrifying place, a place that the Bible says will be full of sadness and sorrow and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, the miracles of Christ are real. Every time we take a breath, it's a miracle. Every baby that is born is a miracle. This universe in which we live is a miracle. Miracles are all around us. And the miracles that Jesus performed while he was here on this earth are real. They are simply more evidence to prove who he is. And this factually recorded evidence has been given to us by the apostles to confirm to us that Jesus is our compassionate Christ our miracle-working God in the flesh.
Christ performed this miracle of feeding. Why? Because he loves all people. And that's what the ministry of the church is also to be about. Love and compassion for all people. When you come across someone in need, do you radiate the love of Jesus through your own love and compassion for them? Are you a Christian who is concerned for those you know, maybe some in your own family, who do not believe and trust in Jesus? Do you love and care enough for their eternal spiritual well-being to tell them about this wonderful Christ who saves? I hope you are concerned. I hope you do care. Because this is certainly one aspect of what we are to learn from Jesus today. Friends, this miracle of Jesus feeding these thousands of people with five barley loaves and two small sardines is an expression of a much larger picture. You see, as important as bread is to the body, the most important aspect of life is bread for the soul. And no matter how much we think we are contented, no matter how much bread rules our lives, it by itself will never satisfy. Because the true bread is the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who died for our sins. Jesus is the one who will resurrect us to glory. And Jesus is the one whom God the Father said, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Friends, Jesus, the good shepherd, loves you. And he wants to give you all that he earned for you on the cross. He is the compassionate Christ, the miracle-working God who is able to cover abundantly all your sins and weaknesses and give to you and to me and everyone who trusts in him his wonderful, gracious gift of everlasting life. Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your wonderful words today. I ask, Father, that you allow the Holy Spirit now to open our hearts and minds to receive this word, to trust in this word, and be saved by this word. Father, we know faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, and we're so thankful that you've given us your holy Bible to tell us all these things which lead us to your promise of everlasting life. Thank you for that tremendous love you gave to us in your son Jesus as he went to the cross for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen.